Hello there, and welcome to Season 5, Episode 7 of the Bitcoin Takeover Podcast. This is a very unique episode, and it's the first one that I do in video first, and it's going to get posted on YouTube before it gets on iTunes and Spotify. And my guest is Thorsten Hoffman, who is the director, producer, and possibly many other roles, and also the leading character of a new documentary about Bitcoin and about how scammy the blockchain industry actually is. And I got to watch the film last week, I think. And I was surprised that I got an email and I was asked if I want to watch it in advance and do an interview. And how can I refuse that? You know, it's a great opportunity. And the film, I think, was launched yesterday, May 7th, worldwide in cinemas. It costs you about $8.99, $8.99 to watch it. And I, yeah, so I recommend that you do watch it. And hello, Torsten, it's good to have you. Uh, thank you for having me on your show. Uh, the podcast with the coolest intro music uh, in, in the world. <laughs> oh, yeah, I wrote <laughs> that and I recorded it. And I'm proud of it. Very cool. No, I, I, it has character. I love it. And just one note, though. So it's actually $8.99 Australian dollars, which is about $5 US or 5 euros or something like that. Um, so it's cheaper than, than you made it sound just now. Okay, so it's discounted from the pre previous offering. So I did watch your documentary, and I think it's a good idea to not give too many spoilers so people still watch it, still have an incentive to check it out. And I was actually fascinated about the way that you presented the whole scaling debate, because it was a big part of your previous film, right? Which was more small budget, it was... I think much more personal and this time you're re revisiting the same characters that you interviewed in your first mm -hmm. documentary and you get to both present how the events turn out and see how people have changed and the whole Bitcoin space has changed because some of the people who are part of this documentary are no longer relevant or not as relevant as they were. Yeah. A hundred percent. So um, maybe to catch people up. So I, I made this um, film, Bitcoin, the end of money as you, you know, Bitcoin, the end of money as we know it in 2014, 2015. Um, back then um, uh, there was only Bitcoin, right? And um, I visited all these early Bitcoin pioneers and uh, the film was about money, what's wrong with money, the history of money, and then what is Bitcoin? And now you're absolutely right how you put it. Now it's kind of revisiting some of these figures. And now it seems like they used to be all on the same side and fighting against the establishment. But now they're like, uh, you know, they have like formed their own tribes, there's different philosophies, and, and we're happy to talk about them. And kind of the, um, the catalyst to make this new film was the skating debate because, oh, I'm like, wow, there's so much drama and so much interesting stuff happening. Um, so let's, um, let's make a new film, right? But to be honest, over time, it's like almost not as relevant anymore. That's like almost a, a chapter that's, that's closed. So at the moment, I think the film is only about seven minutes in, in the film. Um, yeah, but I'm happy to, to discuss this, this more with you. Yeah, and I was impressed by the way you approached Roger Veer because I know that he's difficult and it's hard to get to him and it's hard to debate him because he will just point out facts at you that are not necessarily wrong, but they're ideological. So they're not quite based on technical facts. He just projects his own libertarian ideas onto a technology that doesn't work as he wants to. And I think that's what the scaling debate was all about and that's why it got nasty because in the early days, transferring Bitcoin from one wallet to the other was very cheap and everyone was thinking, oh, this is free money. This is like a way of unbanking the bank and all sorts of catchphrases that they were making up at the time. But as the price increased, they realized that the same amount of Satoshis was worth much more. And some people wanted to have cheap transactions and wanted to scale like that to have cheap transactions and be like Visa. While others, they saw the decentralization potential. And they realized that this is not meant to be a mean of transferring money at scale but rather a secure way of offering decentralized money that cannot be confiscated and cannot be reversed. 
So there is some value in that. There is also some value in trying to be Visa, even though I, I don't really see the point at this moment in time to replace such a centralized service. So what was your experience? I mean, I think um, I used Laura Shin's quote um, to kind of um, summarize the debate, right? Um, one group says um, Bitcoin now is more like digital gold. And there's another group that says uh, Bitcoin should be digital cash. Um, and look, I, I try to be relatively neutral in that debate. I, I give both sides um, uh, time to discuss their philosophies, what they think is wrong with the other side. Um, but I mean, ultimately, the market decides, right? And, and the market has decided, obviously, in terms of what is the more uh, secure store of value, right? I, I mean, I think that's, that's, there's no doubt about that. Um, and also agree with you that in many countries, there might not be a use case for a kind of uh, a better visa, a better uh, credit card. In some countries, there might. And um, it's still early in this, this technology. We don't know the end result yet, but um, I probably agree with you um, with what, how you said it. Yeah. Also, what I liked about the film was the animations that you used to present vaults and how they open and they transfer money from one drawer from the vaults to the other. So that was interesting. And you also presented the scaling debate in a way that basically puts transactions into blocks and how small blocks can scale and big blocks are too large to be processed. I mean, I spoke to some no coiners who have watched the film. I sent them the link and they did not get it. But to me, it was impressive because it's such a complex issue, but visually you were able to compress all that information into one small presentation. Yeah, I mean, the, um, so, I mean, I obviously try to reach newbies as well with a film. Um, I mean, a film like this, you can, you can think of it almost like a funnel, right? So people um, read about the Bitcoin uh, in the newspaper, right? And then hear about it in the news channel or something. And then after they hear it maybe 10, 20 times, then they may watch a, a documentary. And then later they go deeper down the rabbit hole and eventually they end up at a podcast, especially a podcast like yours maybe. And then eventually they, they buy Bitcoin or, or something like that, right? So I'm, I'm on top of the funnel when I'm trying to reach millions of people. So my first film was licensed to 20 different countries. So we were on, on, on a television channel in Sweden and in the Philippines. We were on Singapore Airlines, you know, in, in China uh, on platforms. Um, so I do try to reach a, a, a much more larger audience, but I can't explain Bitcoin to, to non-technical people. So it's, it's almost like an impossible ask, but I, but I tried very hard to make it especially the beginning, the beginning 20, 30 minutes is kind of like newbie friendly. And then it gets maybe a little bit more detailed um, uh, later on. But um, yeah, look, I'm sure that your friend though had a good time and had a few good moments. And surely it's a good conversation starter for them to ask you. So what, what did this mean? What does this mean? And when I do this, you know, it's, it's like conversation starter. And that's what that film should be. Oh yeah, I agree with that. And also I should mention that the film is structured in three very distinct parts and the first one is about bitcoin and how the bitcoin project has evolved and moved on since 2014 2015 when you were promoting your first film the second one is about altcoins and projects like ethereum and what happened to them and all that ico mania that they generated and the third part i would say is about the blockchain mania with lots of companies that say they want to create their own private blockchain and they want to use it for whatever purpose that doesn't really make much sense. And you also expose some scams and you, I think my first, not my first, my favorite part is where you get the founder of the ERC20 tokens, the ERC20 standard. And he says, you know, like 5% of projects are scams and all the rest are legit, but not maybe that they cannot handle their they they cannot fulfill their plans and then you have i i don't remember her name but she says that 95 percent of projects are scams so that that was funny the way you juxtapose these two quotes from different people one who who says basically defends his own invention and says that ERC-20 tokens are used for legit projects and the other person says, oh no, they're scams, most of them. 
Yeah, and, and and just going back to to the three act structure. So so the whole um, you called it private blockchains, uh, and many of them are private blockchains. You're probably you're absolutely right. But that that whole philosophy, that whole movement, is about Web 3.0, right? Kind of like decentralize uh, the, the the internet, right? Get get away from the Facebook and the online advertisers, and um, it, you know create online identity that really belongs to you and so forth. And this interesting project, but I mean um, at the moment we don't know which one works, right? I mean, um, I think that's like in my end monologue, that's like one of the, uh, the, 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 the final um, conclusions is, look, uh, interesting stuff is happening, there's scams happening, but um, to be honest, there's only one project that's really decentralized, that really has stood the test of time, which is Bitcoin. And, and I think a lot of maximalists have problems with my film because it's hard to stomach some of the other content. They don't like to see you know, Bitcoin Cash, they don't like to see Ethereum, but actually you have to tell that whole story in order for the end to make sense. Um, and um, again, I'm not trying to, to, to tell the audience what to think, maybe accept that little last monologue. I also let them, um, you know, look, look these people in, in the eye and, and think, okay, I believe this guy, I don't believe this guy, right? I mean, it's, it's my job as a storyteller to entertain you, to tell interesting stories, but um, you should make up your own mind, right? And not everybody will come to the same conclusion. I mean, it's kind of hard. When I saw Roger Veer, how he's basically the stubborn one, like the way he gets portrayed Maybe he will, I'm not sure what his reaction was, but I'm pretty sure he wouldn't like it because he seemed like the lonely person who is supporting a dying project, which is true. But at the same time, if he was in charge of how he gets presented, he would just say, oh, they stole the narrative. They stole the name. They stole whatnot. And we are the real. Actually, he seems like some sort of religious leader who separated from the Look, and and I give him and I give him uh, you know time to express his thoughts that everybody in the industry uh, knows. Um, but also, it's important, I think, not to whitewash history, right? Because I mean, he has been one of the key figures. If you read Digital Gold, that famous, famous book that is must read for everyone uh, about the early first four or five years in Bitcoin, um, it, it becomes clear what an, a key figure he was. Um, so that would be my one comment. And the other comment is, I mean, he, when I first met him in 2014, he was talking about, uh, you know, global free trade and, and uh, free, you know, digital cash. And he hasn't changed that story, right? Um, so in a way he's consistent, but um, I understand that's part of the story, right? He used to be Bitcoin Jesus and now he's kind of like Bitcoin Judas because he kind of, um, yeah, led to that fork yeah but it's still interesting because nobody else in the film supports his view so from this point of view you can say it's biased but it's also proportional to reality because you don't find many people who were in the early days involved in the bitcoin project who support bitcoin cash yeah well i mean look uh Everybody will say, oh, I, I want to have a larger role in this film. You know, this project should be more important. Um, but, but you're absolutely right. I think it's pretty clear that Bitcoin has the largest proponent, proponent in the film and it's also the most important uh, project. So uh, in, in a way, yeah, that's a good, good, good observation. And even, again, a lot of Maximals will not like to see that much of Roger in the film. But look, um, he, he is an historic figure and this whole philosophical debate, the civil war is an important historic chapter in the history, right? And it teaches us a lot. Yeah, and you did a lot of traveling for this film. You went to Japan to meet Roger. You went to the United States, possibly, I'm not sure, but yeah. it's likely that it was the United States where you met Charlie Lee and also Samson Mao. I'm not sure where you met him, but you did interview him. And you also went to Switzerland to show that bunker of a storage of bitcoins and i'm not sure if that's also a mining facility but it's huge and it used to be owned by the military and it, it's just impressive how xapo i think they are the ones who store their value there yeah 
Now, uh, quickly, just to finish that list. So we also filmed in Berlin. We also filmed in Hong Kong and uh, United States was San Francisco and Los Angeles uh, and London, uh, of course, as well. Um, so yeah, it was a huge production. Um, but but yeah, going to that bunker was definitely the highlight of, of the film. Um, so newbies like it um, uh, and even OGs like it because, I mean, nobody's been in that vault before. Certainly no, no camera crew. And this is where apparently or allegedly 10% of Bitcoin keys are, are stored. Although that's technically not quite correct because only one fifth of the keys stored there and the other four fifth um, are in four different continents. So it, it's like this, this um, uh, system that they developed. I know that um, you know, the, the purist will say, well, you have to hold your own keys, uh, otherwise it's not your Bitcoin, which is true. But undoubtedly there's this um, demand for uh, custodial uh, services, right? So if you are an investment fund or you take care of other people's money or if you are just not so techy or you're scared of losing your keys, you use a service like that. And, and Zappo has, I think, uh, 7 million uh, customers a at the time of filming. They might have a lot more now. And uh, wow, that shoot going down into that military bunker and, and seeing those, um, yeah, it was incredible. It looks incredible. And I also enjoyed the view from the security cameras that you used for <laughs> the footage. It painted the whole picture, you know, that you're the ones filming, but you're also the ones being filmed. Yeah, and actually uh, uh, an interesting story maybe for, for you listeners. Um, so I had, sorry, is my camera shaking too much? Okay, um, so I had um, a screening in Switzerland with a lot of um, bankers, right? Traditional conservative bankers. A lot of them still don't get it, but they're interested, but they still don't understand it. After watching this Bitcoin bunker scene, they're like, oh, now I get it. There's real infrastructure being built. There's really value, billions of, of, of dollars stored there. This is not just a hobby project. Bitcoin is serious business, right? And I think that's like when I exit that, uh, that scene, I'm saying something, well, if you don't think Bitcoin is challenging the concept of money, you haven't been paying attention. That's, that's the quote. Oh, yeah. I very much like that. And yeah, you went to great lengths to produce this film. I suppose you had a great budget and you also had sponsors. I don't know how it works, but you did a great job from this point of view because you went all around the world to show what Bitcoin is like. Yeah, it was a, a long journey, two years. And, uh, you know, I use a lot of footage from the, not a lot, a little bit of footage from 2014 uh, as well from my first film. So yeah, in, in a way you could say I've been working on this for six years and that's why it's um, critical time for me now to try to monetize the film um, uh, pay-per-view at the moment. It then will go um, to other platforms and then to television channels as well. Yeah, uh, if there is any way in which I can support you to get to Romanian cinemas, I mean, I'm, I don't think I have contacts, but I can facilitate communication because I know the language. So I guess we can keep in touch. I would love to get my friends after this crazy pandemic ends and put them in the same room in a cinema and make them watch the film. Yeah, and, and I can tell you in a cinema, watching this with a group is, is, is a different experience. You know, people are laughing at scenes or, or you know, there's a little bit of energy in, in, in room in certain uh, scenes. Uh, but let me ask you this, uh, do you think there's a, there's a potential for the for Romanian subtitles because the more subtitled versions I have, the larger the the global reach, or in, in your case, the Romanian reaches. I mean, maybe we can discuss that offline. Yeah, there is potential <laughs> always, and I, I like your project. I think your heart is in the right place when you produce this because there are lots of films being made, and I remember I watched the documentary by the BBC in 2018, I think. So that's two and a half years ago. And it was terrible. It sucked so much. They had great visuals, great presentation. I think they understood how mining works quite well. But other than that, they failed to grasp how Bitcoin works and to present it as such. Yeah, and you look, know, they might might not have been from the community, right? I've been in this community for six years now. Maybe that makes a difference as well. Um, and um, one thing I, I do want to maybe add to this point, but also to your earlier point, is the BBC or Discovery Channel or Netflix is not going to license this film um, if it's a fanboy film, if it's, if it's one-sided um, and it just talks about one, one project. This needs to be about the movement, about the different tribes, about the tribes fighting each other, about a supervillain, about a hero, uh, you know, a Jesus and a Judas. And, and you know, and this, you need these elements. And... Um, uh, 
if, if you do it right, and I'm trying to position myself as like the, the journalist asking tough questions, right? And making everyone feel a little bit uncomfortable, making every, you know, like asking tough questions to these people and, and looking into their eyes and, and, and see how they react. And I think that is important if you want to get a, a global reach for this film. Oh yeah, you need a Campbellian story arc of the hero, right? The hero's journey, except that the hero is Bitcoin in our case. You have people who support it, people who try to take it down, people who try to replicate it, people who try to steal parts of it to make it private. That's interesting. I mean, yeah, uh, that's and going to be my review, by the way. When I write my review of the film, I'm going to say that this is a Campbellian story arc with the hero's journey. Where I love it. I love Bitcoin. it. And and and, may, and you remember um, we also have like this historic um, chapter about the history of the internet. And and there you could see that you know early on in in, in the the history of TCP/IP, it also wasn't quite clear what is this, what is it going to be used for? Are these companies trying to uh, co-opt it or buy it? You know, and and it just took many many decades. And I really like this this way of thinking that you know we we always tend to think short term on the price. What happens with this happening on no, it's, it's the halvening in 12 years, right? That really matters if you think about it. Oh, yeah. I know exactly what you're saying. And you have been around for six years, so you have seen a lot. This is your second halvening, I guess. Yeah, yeah. So you know that it's a non-event. It's like the new year, you know, people celebrate it, but nothing really changes. You just change a page in the calendar. Maybe in the case of Bitcoin, it does change. Actually, not maybe, definitely it changes because miners are going to have to adapt to a different environment and they're going to have to become much more efficient if they want to keep on operating. And I think that's part of the beauty of it because they have to constantly innovate and renew their technology and use the cheapest form of energy, which just happens to be renewable. And I saw a discussion, okay, I actually had a guest in this season who is a very big fan of mining with oil. And now that oil, I think a couple of weeks ago, we even had negative prices. There was this huge, you know, brainstorming. And they were saying, okay, so how about we buy oil and burn it to mine Bitcoin? But I, I'm not a fan of that. I mean, we, we have sunlight, right? L look at it, how it's ruining my otherwise perfect picture. We should use this. Yeah, I, um, I didn't have enough time to um, go into mining for, for this film, but um, I really like the concept of, you know, what is ultimately in this universe, what, what is the ultimate currency? It's energy, right? Energy is what everything is made of and makes happen. And, and Bitcoin equals energy, right? If you have energy, you can create Bitcoins anywhere on the planet instantly, and then you can transfer that value any, anywhere else instantly. I mean, that, it's a very powerful uh, concept. And, and um, Andreas, I think I have a little YouTube video uh, where, we, where we talked about this, and I'm sure you know about this much better than I do. Um, this whole concept of, well, maybe you have a wind farm or a solar farm in the middle of nowhere, no people live there. Uh, so the energy is kind of um, wasted or you, you wouldn't even build your solar farm there. But with Bitcoin, you can, right? And so, so it's a way to, to kind of kickstart that, that uh, sustainable energy revolution in a way. Yeah. The energy that doesn't get used can actually produce something. That's a powerful thought. Because it's hard to transfer energy. It's also hard to store it for longer amounts of time and move it somewhere else. Because you can argue that it's needed and there are places that don't have electricity. And that's a valid concern. You're going to say, yeah, but how can you actually transfer energy? I mean, I suppose Nikola Tesla wanted us to transfer electric energy without wires and cables. But we haven't gotten to that point, I think. Yeah. Who is... A super fascinating character in his own right, yeah. Also, what I noticed in lots of documentaries about Bitcoin, they present lots of scams and they don't make the distinction. And that's what scares the audience usually. Because they say, oh, this is Bitcoin, it's revolutionary, it's gold 2.0, digital gold, digital money, whatever, peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash. But then they show something like BitConnect and one coin and they make the transition without any context 
And then they interview people who have lost their life savings investing in those scams. And in the minds of people, there's going to be this association that's wrongful between what Bitcoin is and what all of these other scams are. I, I love how you put this. Hundred um, percent um, right. And you know all this, all this human drama, right? That that uh, father who got uh, kidnapped, and then he, his daughter uh, can't uh, afford whatever. I mean, this, these are touching stories, and as a storyteller, I know why they do it. But you have to be very careful because. Um, this is not about um, some guy losing money trading or being stoned. This is about a movement that's maybe the most important, uh, you know, moment in economic history of recent times, right? So this is much bigger than this one trader that lost something on, on a scam ICO, right? Uh, and and I try to, yeah, again, make that. I have a fun ICO scam chapter and two or three laughs in that one, but I think it's kind of separate and contained and then we move on to more important questions. Yeah, and I, I think it was useful that you interviewed the person who invented the ERC-20 standard because it is due to his invention that lots of scams have been enabled and you confronted this view with him and he did not agree with it, not entirely, but if you look at all the ICOs, they were just the RC20 tokens that were built on the Ethereum blockchain. And you can just copy, copy and paste the code and create your own token in like five minutes. And then you create a landing page with your ICO and you transfer the tokens according to some sort of plan that you created. And that's mm -hmm. it. You had an ICO. It's insane how many people got rich doing this. And it was also funny that you showed... What's the name of that scam? Prodium or something. The one oh, yeah. that left all investors with a blank homepage which just said penis. <laughs> yeah, uh, the, but, but you know, the, maybe a, a meta point here is, right? Maybe in, in, in a technological revolution, there has to be this stage where the, there's a lot of new money dumb money flowing in a lot of speculation a lot of hype everybody talks about it. a lot of people getting rich and then they're losing it every uh, all the same thing happened with the dot-com uh, bubble when the internet came out right Pe people started their own website torsten.com and did an ipo and uh, there was no business plan there was nothing nothing behind it and and recently two three years ago people started torsten coin and, and thought that's going to be you know worth millions of course looking at it now it's stupid it's silly but maybe we needed to learn that lesson right yeah, but sadly, I think we're going to see the same cycle at least once with another bull run that we're going to have. And there's going to be lots of money pouring into Ethereum and Ethereum killers and Ethereum 2.0 or whatever they invent. And Dude. it's not going to be 100% legit. And there's no way to prevent this because that's the whole point of decentralization. Anyone can mm -hmm. use the technology for anything. I don't think that human greed has any sort of miraculous cure. So there's going to be investors <laughs> for all of these projects. There are people who basically have the mindset of let's put a hundred dollars in every scam and hope that one of them goes 100 X. So if I put my money in 50 of these, then I will still have a profit if one of them goes right. X. So, I agree with you that human greed, there's, there's no, no stopping uh, human greed and human stupidity. I agree with you, but I'm not sh So I, I want to think that in the next bull run, those super scammy Bitconnects and one coins and I, I don't even know the names of them, that they hopefully don't happen, but, but maybe you're right because it's just a larger audience and there's always some, some guy peddling the, the newest thing to some naive investor. So yeah, maybe you're right. I, I'm not sure. There's also this mindset that even though you know that something is a Ponzi and it's obviously one, you know that if you get in early enough and just wait a few months and then withdraw your money, it's likely that you're going to make a profit because that's how Ponzi's work. Early money is the one that wins and the last person to enter is the one who pays for everybody else's gains. Yeah. So that's yeah. why it works i guess because people assume it's the early days and they keep on dumping their bags on somebody else and 
there is going to be a greater fool out yeah. of all of this. I remember so, there was news about BitConnect 2.0 launching, so I don't know what to say. I, I only saw the headlines and I, I didn't even, I mean, yeah, it's just, but maybe some people will fall for it, yeah. Um, so, so do you think that this um, film might be able to help with Bitcoin adoption or, or, or a larger conversation with people who, you know, might not be an investor yet or not be familiar with this and, and that then um, older generations of Bitcoiners can then kind of um, have these discussions with their friends and family members uh, to bring them into this new way of thinking? I agree that it's a conversation starter. I, I'm happy that we changed roles right now, but I, I agree that it's a conversation starter. And also, I think it's better than the one on Netflix, which is called, wait, what's the name of? Banking, banking on Bitcoin. Banking on Bitcoin, yeah. I think it's better than that one, and it's definitely updated as opposed to the views presented there. I, I know that is going to start conversations between parents and children, especially when children make their parents watch something and then they explain stuff. So uh, from this point of view, it's very useful. I'm not mm -hmm. sure if, well, if it will single-handedly increase adoption because it gets confusing after a while. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it is the funnel that, that we talked about. I mean, I remember when I first started down that rabbit hole, I consumed everything that I could find, right? And so it started with just hearing about it and then going very deep and then listening to podcasts for hours and hours. And, and, and one film or one book cannot, cannot make you a, a, you know, a follower or a believer by itself. Um, yeah, no, sorry. You you should be interviewing me, not the other way around. Sorry about that. No, I, I didn't criticize you. I just <laughs> noticed that it's funny that this happened because usually you're the one asking questions, so you just did what you usually do. So I don't mind it. I'm actually happy that we get to talk about this. And if I were to change anything in your documentary, actually, I should ask you first, what would you change if there was anything that you were able to do to add or remove to feature what would it be? And then I'm going to mention what I would see as an important addition or change to the documentary. Right. So um, I've done cinema screenings in five different countries and, and people always come up after these um, events to me and say, look to Austin, love the film, but you should have talked about this or that or this or that. Right. And then suddenly, I mean, if I, if I had a list of all this, this would be a 10 hour series. So I, I had to be super selective. Also, remember, if I interview someone like Andreas, right, um, it's going to be two hours of footage and he's so good. Like every other sentence is like a punchline. Right. I could just use him all along. But at the end of the day, some of these interviews are, are getting condensed into 22 seconds, right? It, 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 it's a hard job as a filmmaker. So um, I'm very curious to hear what you think, but in terms of um, other things, there's, there's, there's one little, it's not a mistake, but it's, it's, it's something like, it's not 100% clear in that 3D animation that I would still like to do. So in my television versions that I'm gonna do um, later this year, I have to fix a little, just a technical thing that, that bothers me because I've now seen it a hundred times and um, it, it bothers me, but it's a small thing. Nobody else will, will, will see it. Right, so if there was anything that he could add and it could have been useful, I noticed that you did interview Samson Mao and he works for Blockstream and they work on a side chain that's called Liquid. And I don't feel like that was highlighted enough as a scalability solution. And also you didn't include anything about the Lightning Network, which has been quite a big deal in the last couple of years. Yeah, actually, let me comment on that one. So, um, like, so that whole, like, like I said earlier, the whole civil war was kind of, how I started that project because it was so interesting, right? Um, but but we tested this. So I, that chapter was, used to be much, much longer. And, you know, Roger fighting against all these guys. It was entertaining and funny and stuff. But we tested it and a lot of people just found it confusing and not that relevant to the larger movement. Um, and I actually did have something on Lightning, even like a 3D animation, talk to Samson about it. I talked to many people about it. But it was just um, it was just one of those things that had to be cut because it was getting just too long. It was like a, a one hour, 40 minute uh, uh, film at, at one point. But I think I mean, that is a very fair criticism. I should have at least maybe mentioned it because in a way that is the solution 
toward um, Bitcoin Cash as are trying to do, right? Like like a, a cheap digital cash, and that that is a second layer um, um, solution. So I think that's that's a fair criticism. Yeah, and the whole whoa, look at my color. The whole idea of Bitcoin scalability is that you're going to build stacks on top of the base layer. So you're going to have a solid and decentralized base layer, and then you're going to add another second layer and then a third layer and side chains and all sorts of inventions that come on top of the base layer so that they bring different types of innovations and features that cannot be put on the base layer because it's supposed to remain decentralized. Which is exactly what happened with TCP IP and the internet right over many decades. Yeah, and that's why the best of engineers who are involved in Bitcoin development are the ones who came up with this idea and they supported it and they did not want to compromise the base layer by increasing the block size. And I looked at interviews, I I researched a little bit about the history of supporting, you know, Bitcoin Classic and what was the other one, Unlimited, and then there was... There was another one, but before Segwit2x and all of that, I mean, these people, the ones who supported them did not, some of them did not have the best of intentions and some of them were just business people who just wanted their businesses to scale faster. So they did not care about the technology. They just wanted their businesses to handle the more minus, operations. Right? Are you talking about the miners who had a had a commercial interest to have a larger blocks? Look, I, oh, I no. know that that was just Bitmain because uh, yeah, yeah. Segwit yeah. was disabling one of their ASIC boosts, so they were not able to mm. get the same kind of performance with their devices. So, from this point of view, it was commercial interest on their behalf, and that's why they jumped so quickly to Bitcoin Cash. Actually, they co-founded it, I think, but I don't want to get sued by them for these claims. Hmm. Well, um, there's, there's a quote um, uh, from Andreas, which I don't think made the final edit, but uh, he kind of said that a, a little bit is a little bit too early to tell. We don't really know yet um, this is going to be uh, playing out in the next decades. I mean, obviously, um, Bitcoin is stands far all the other projects. I'm just, I'm, yeah, um, but but that doesn't mean that that some of the other um, uh, projects are um, completely uh, worthless. And again, um, what he told me is, money means something different if you are in uh, Venezuela right now than if 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 you are sitting in Germany right now, right? So um, it's 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 hard to make make generalizations, but uh, I think that the overall message is kind of clear at, at this moment about Bitcoin, right? Yeah, uh, that's a fair point, even though I don't believe that. I mean, I'm not a hardcore maximalist, but I am sort of a soft one. So I agree that some projects have their claim and do develop something interesting that sooner or later is going to get added into Bitcoin. Mm. But I don't think that they will still exist 10 years from now. They're just software experiments, right. just like different distributions of Linux whatever they develop is going to be taken because it's open source code is going to be taken and adopted on something that's more robust and more resilient yeah. and provides a more solid base layer for that technology to actually work at scale. Yeah, I mean, this whole question of, of maximalism uh, or maximalism is super, super fascinating to me because um, in a way, a movement like this needs an ideological, hardcore, fundamental this group, right? Um, to start a religion, you you need those kind of people, right? But but at the same time, um, it, it's also um, almost easy to make fun of people who don't look at anything. So 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 this this concept of every anything else but Bitcoin is a scam, right? Which which is part of the the maximalist. Uh, uh, battle cry that is also dangerous right you kind of shut 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 yourself off from anything else what's going on outside because exactly what you said other innovations might actually work or might be interesting and and again 
we don't know how it's going to play out. Maybe Ethereum uh, will become a platform for, I, I don't know, just making this up, mobile games. Isn't that what Tron is doing or something? Let, I mean, you know, that's something completely different than Bitcoin. So, so um, you know, let them, let them try. It's all experiments and some, most will fail most will fail some might succeed um, but as a store of value i think it's unlikely that many will succeed it's very likely that only one will succeed i think i read a joke somewhere about aws which is amazon web server mm. if they were to shut down some of their service they would also take down ethereum with them because lots of nodes are ran on aws and it's not as decentralized as bitcoin I mean, it's also interesting to define decentralization because if you ask people who are into Bitcoin, they're going to explain to you that being decentralized means that you run your own node and yeah. you validate your own transactions and you don't need somebody else. You, you don't need to trust somebody else to handle your transactions. But if you ask people in the Ethereum space, they don't care. They're fine with having just, I think they only have like free archival nodes Archival meaning that they are the ones that store all transactions since the Genesis block. And the rest of them, they just store like a certain amount of gigabytes. And not even the Ethereum Foundation runs an archival node anymore, which mm -hmm. is scary. Because let's say that you deployed some sort of DAP or smart contract in the early days of Ethereum. And if there's nobody else out there to run it, to operate it, then you will not be able to access your funds or whatever was being deployed on that smart contract. The conditions are no longer in place. So I suppose that if you did that, it's in your best interest to be the one who runs the node. But the cost of doing it is at this point industrial. And what's his name? Eric Wall. He tried to run a full Ethereum node on a high-end system. And it took him more than two months to sync it. And he needed a crazy amount of storage. And he could not do anything else with his laptop. And it's unlikely that at any point in the future, he will still be able to use the same system to run it. So he needs to go find some sort of specialized hardware to be able to do it, which is inaccessible to the average user. Uh, which, which is a uh, criticism uh, BSV uh, get, gets as well, right? Because they want to have those gigabyte size blocks, which sounds nice on paper, but um, actually running it is impossible if, if you're not someone like Amazon. Um, I think, you know, um, after visiting all these people and talking about some of the scams and some of the winding back of the, their blockchains and stuff like that, the, the quote in the, in the film is, um, you know, looking at all these leaders of these projects, um, my line is, but just how different are they from our current political, financial, and business leaders? Are their systems really resistant to corruption, immune to manipulation, and worthy of our trust? And, and, and that, go, that goes right into the Bitcoin story because it is the only one that is truly decentralized. But you need to see some of these other systems fail people lose money. You need to see, uh, you know, people getting rich and losing, and losing money to understand that, um, I think. Yeah. And it's funny that you mentioned that you went to London and you mentioned BSV because there is a certain character who gets visited by you during the film and he shows you some patents that he filed and he seems friendly, but at the same time, I don't know the whole story behind how you got to him. And I'm not sure if it makes any sense to present him, but it, it doesn't matter because he seems wacky. So the perception that I got, the vibe that he projects to the viewers is that he's this eccentric person who is detached from everything else that's going on, who only has his narrow vision about what should happen and supports this niche cryptocurrency that's not supported by anyone else except for his claims and he yeah. wants to patent everything but claims to be the inventor of bitcoin i don't know that does that make sense to a newbie <laughs> to get fooled so so um i think i think um it's important to watch this segment um and make make up your own mind i mean it's, certainly he's highly entertaining and he's an he's an interesting character um again i let him 
um, do his thing about his patents because no one else talks about patents in this whole industry. Um, but I also have, I think, six, maybe seven people commenting on what they think about Craig Wright. Um, so um, don't don't be. Uh, there's a reason why he's in the film, um, and it, it's it's it, it will become clear when you watch that scene. Um, so don't be don't be uh, put off by by seeing his face uh, on, on the trailer. I didn't watch the trailer, actually, to my shame, I didn't. But I did watch the entire movie, and it was interesting to watch him and observe the way he behaves. And you played chess with him, or was it was that really a game of chess, or did you just do it for show? It was uh, for show because we had two cameras circling us, and I got the shot that I wanted. Um, but yeah, we we weren't actually playing. I heard that he cannot even code a hello world program in C++ when he was asked. So I was curious to know if he can play chess. Can't tell you the answer to either question. <laughs> okay. Well, let's move on. Even though the claim of gigabyte blocks is also invalid, because if you look at the history of issued blocks on the BSV blockchain, you're going to see that the average block size is smaller than the one on BTC, on the real Bitcoin. So uh, yeah, they have empty blocks and it's just spikes sometimes. You see the graph spiking because somebody uploads stuff, but nobody really does it because it's expensive and it doesn't make much sense, right? It's just gimmicky. They try to do their own version of Twitter and Instagram on the blockchain, but what's the point? Um, I was surprised um, a couple months ago, uh, I was in London uh, before the whole pandemic and there was this um, BSV conference, I guess. And I was surprised about the amount of people and the amount of applications and I don't know who these people are. I just was there to say hi to someone for five minutes. Um, but it's, so it's dangerous to say, oh, this is only a scam, or it's dangerous to say, oh, this is just a one-man show, because there were 500 people in that room, and I don't know, maybe, I don't know, 50 entrepreneurs building stuff on it. Um, it's still probably 100 times smaller than Ethereum. Ethereum has this large, you know, entrepreneurial ecosystem around it, and, and Bitcoin slightly different, because Bitcoin has that one uh, clear use case, uh, whereas Ethereum has maybe hundreds of use cases with without really knowing which one has, has yet to be figured out. Um, but you know, this is, who knows how it's gonna play out. I, I think it just belongs into this film because it's part of the story, it's part of that movement. Yeah, it, it would have been interesting to go to Kelvin's island and also interview him. But I, did you even contact him? No, no. I mean, look, I, I, this whole, the BSV thing, I, I get criticized a lot for even having Craig in in the film, and uh, to expand that chapter more, um, yeah, no, there was no no interest uh, for me to do that. Okay, because I suppose, if I'm not mistaken, at some point you mentioned that when Bcash was created, it was with the support of a gambling mogul. So you, you do mention him. Oh yeah, yeah, that's true. That's true. So uh, yep. Um, Basically, we let Roger say, "Okay, did you, you know that they they um his his um his whole spiel about digital cash, right?" And then basically, I say, "Well, Roger teams up with an, a controversial um billionaire, a controversial online gaming gambling billionaire. That's Kevin Eckler, um, Bitmain, and this guy, and then Craig Wright. Um, so so that I kind of um." summarize that movement, so the early Bitcoin cash movement with those four characters, which isn't entirely true, there's other people and stuff like that, and then they split again, right? But, but that's, that's a storytelling tool that I, that I used. Yeah, that's, that's correct. I, did, I do mention it for a second. So the film was launched yesterday to global audiences, and you can watch it for about $5 right now. Did you get any kind of feedback or emails, reception, anything, critiques? 
Yeah, so um, we have, I think, 25 reviews or something on, on IMDb. So our IMDb score at the moment is 9.2 or something. So um, uh, that feedback has been good. Uh, feedback on Twitter from like the wider community has been uh, great. Um, feedback from the 10 or nine different cinema events um, that I've done is, is, has been great. Although, I mean, clearly some Maximals don't like parts of it. Some uh, uh, people say, well, you should have done more with Ethereum or more with BSV, right? So, I mean, I can't make everyone happy, but I think I kind of capture this moment in time. And um, I'm super proud, maybe I should say that, I'm super proud of the fact that um, all types of audience kind of find something in this film that really speaks to them. So another example is I was in Luxembourg and the guy, the, uh, the guy, um, blockchain responsible guy in the EU commission was sitting next to me and another ministry of Luxembourg digital transformation. And those guys after the film, they were in the panel and they kind of related their work to the film, right? And then I went to Switzerland and this is all about money there and investment. And they related what they're doing with custody of Bitcoins to the film and, you know, the bunker scene. So there's this content in it for, for everyone. And I think the, the end message people will have to see for themselves, but I think it's, it's a valuable um, and entertainment, entertaining uh, a, a little film that hopefully gets the conversation started. And th this film might not be 100% suited for you or one of your listeners, but it might be perfectly suited for their friends who have now heard about Bitcoin 20 times, but still haven't quite gotten it. So in this film, hopefully they, they understand the wider movement around it. I'm certainly happy that the film was directed, written and produced by somebody who is part of the community because it's hard for me to imagine what it would have looked like if it was somebody who just landed in this whole crazy space and had to figure out while doing the movie. And do you think that you would have done anything differently if you didn't know as much? If you got into Bitcoin, let's say, a year ago, you think your perception would have been different and you would have presented everything differently? Yeah, no, I think I think that that historic perspective really helped me or helped shape my view, right? Somebody else might have different views, um, which is a good thing, but maybe it's also a bad thing because I, I, I come from from a slightly earlier period and I might have, you know, not interviewed people that otherwise I would have, right? Because um, a lot of these you know, the whole Wall Street movement and all these people in New York right now, um, they are very important in this, in this scene, right? But I, I didn't even go to New York. I didn't even talk to them because for me, the hardcore Bitcoiners, the hardcore, uh, you know, uh, the, the cypherpunks are kind of what Bitcoin means to me. If you ask someone at Wall Street, they might think something different. So, yeah, I guess it really matters who you are and how you tell the story for sure. Also, there is a segment in which you present a legit business that has used the private blockchain and an ICO, I think. And it's about renewable energy and stuff like that. And I was thinking, why does it make sense? Because you ask them, why do you need a blockchain for this? And they, they present the basic response. You know, they stop double spendings and they support their coin, which incentivizes people to save energy which is a legit claim, but they could have done everything that they did with that project without being on the blockchain and without issuing their own tokens and by having investors into the project. So it's nice that they're doing it, but at the same time, they should not claim that it couldn't have been done otherwise. There, there's a you know, the, the critic in the film, David Girard, he's kind of the, the guy who makes fun of, of the, the, this whole movement. Um, and he said something quite interesting um, about private blockchains. He, he basically made, made your point, said, well, you know, the Walmart private blockchain project, is, it's just a centralized beta database because it's, it's run by Walmart and it, Walmart tells their suppliers to use it and now it's called blockchain supply chain, da 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 da, da. Um, So what's the point, right? That's what you just said. But there is actually a point because without using the word blockchain, they wouldn't have gotten the New York Times, Times newspaper headline for the project. And the CTO of Walmart wouldn't have gotten the budget approved by you know, the, the board or the shareholder or something, something, right? So the buzzword did help them in, in this case. Whether it works or not, you know, th that's why 
I, I don't understand the hate for the word blockchain. I mean, let them build their blockchains, let them build their, their database. What, what, what does it bother you, right? If, if you want to stack your sets, that has nothing to do what Walmart does with their supply chains of avocados. So uh, I, I don't see a problem with that. Uh, it's crazy because if you think about it, you can just put QR codes that track all the way from source to the retail store. So delivery companies like DHL have been doing this for 10 plus years. They track from where the package comes and they track every step. They just scan and the data gets put into their database and that's it. But all of a sudden they thought they can use a blockchain to store every piece of information about this and help end users or consumers to receive more data which only means that the system that they were using before is so terrible that they bought into this system that cannot really scale and is expensive to maintain to produce something that could be delivered more conveniently in other ways mm -hmm. that's what puzzles me sometimes yeah look i'm not a technical expert but truth is i mean this is part of the story right private blockchains is part of this whole uh story that we're writing and i mean i wouldn't put my money into it i wouldn't uh, buy into avocado coin and probably you wouldn't right um that's why i think that the overall message is clear but um there's also no point in denying that this is happening there's no point in denying that people um that you don't like exist because they do exist right or there are projects um that are scams they do exist so i cover them as, as a journalist so to speak Okay, so do you have any closing notes about the film? Something that makes you convince people to possibly buy the premium package, which is slightly more expensive and comes with bonuses? <laughs> yeah, yeah, we, we offer a little bit of free free goodies there with a few um, interesting books and e, e, e magazines and, and, and podcasts there. But um, no, if you are interested in the topic, if you still haven't convinced your friends uh, or family members what, why you're so excited about this movement, this film might be the right tool for you. Um, also, if you want to support independent filmmakers, um, um, I really appreciate if you just check out cryptopiafilm.com, um, you know, spend the, the price of a coffee on this, I would really appreciate it. And um, hit me up on Twitter um, at Cryptopia Film or some other channels, um, tell me how you like it. And I'm sure you're not going to like 100% of it, but I'm also sure that you like a lot of it as well. So um, uh, yeah, feel free to uh, debate. So Torsten, I'm very happy that you agreed to do this interview and I will post this today because I wanted to get out as fast as possible. And also hope that you're not going to stop here and you will produce a sequel or something to present what's going to happen in the Bitcoin space in the next five, 10 years, because that's useful and you have the context. And I suppose that by now you have the contacts. So- And, and historic footage, right? Historic footage, so to speak, from mm -hmm. 14, 2019. And yeah, it'll be interesting, yeah. You're like the cinema guy of Bitcoin who presents what has happened in the last six years now. So that's useful and we need that. And I'm personally grateful. I'm not sure about other people, maybe that they have different expectations. That's fair. We all want something from others, but I think that what you do is great. And I want, I hope that you keep on going. Well, thank you so much for your show. Um, again, uh, this was a great interview and I love your entry, uh, the, the, the intro music as well. And um, thanks for having me.